There are new education standards that have been mandated for school districts throughout California and in the rest of the nation. What are these new standards and why do many educators think they will lead to better performing students nationwide? We'll answer these questions and more on Talking with Henrietta, coming up next. Hi, I'm Henrietta. Welcome to the show. Many think America has been falling behind other countries when it comes to teaching students basic skills and enabling them to compete in our global economy. In 2009, education leaders and governors from 48 states led an effort to develop education standards that would enable all students throughout America to graduate from high school with a high quality education. The education standards they developed are called Common Core Standards. On this show, I have three guests who will discuss the Common Core Standards and the reasons their supporters think that they will be more effective than previous methods for teaching students in our public schools. On my far left is Dr. Gloria hernandez Golf, the superintendent of the Ravenswood City School District in East Palo Alto. Seated beside her on my immediate left is Paul Pinza, the associate principal of the William C. Overfelt High School in San Jose. To my immediate right is Braulio Gonzalez, who is a co-program director with Youth United for Community Action, also known as Yuca, which is an East Palo Alto grassroots community organization run by young people. Well, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining Thank me. You. Are you happy? Do you feel satisfied that there are now new education standards called Common Core Standards? Absolutely. I, I think that, um, as you stated, um, and we were talking a little earlier, the three of us, on how uh, the system has changed in the last few years where uh, there is a lot more creativity, a lot more acknowledgement of the different ways students learn and a lot more opportunities for them to express um, how they're learning by uh, some performance-based um, assessments, portfolios, uh, demonstrating their ability by things that they can create. Paul, do you agree with that? Do you, are you satisfied? Do you think Common Core, new Common Core standards were necessary? Absolutely. I think they're necessary for a couple of reasons. One, um, now our state and much of the country has a very clear pathway to get students ready to go to college. K through 12, we know what's necessary in terms of teaching and learning at every step of the way. Secondly, in California specifically, um, I'm excited about the Common Course push to make sure English language skills are developed across all subject areas at every level. Because of our high English learner population, I think that's mm -hmm. essential to make sure that access to college is equitable across the board. Okay, Braulio, do you agree? Yeah, I share, I share the, uh, the feelings of both my colleagues here, but I also think this is an opportunity to really look into other, other um, areas of the education system to really fi figure out what are some of the voids that need to be filled. And so I, I'm really, you know, one of the things that I'm really excited about with Common Core, it gives an opportunity for, for uh, community organizations, parents, students, and administrators and, and teachers to work collaboratively to, to implement a, a better, a new vision of education. Well, you would think on the basis of what you said, especially you, Paul, that this is something that we had all along, uh, and it wasn't. So what was wrong with what we had? Well, uh, again, what we had previously was um, basically a paper and pencil assessment that really only measured um, one way of demonstrating success and mastery of knowledge. And it was very much a, these are the correct answers and this is the only way you can show that you understand and that you have capacity and that you've learned. 
and uh, that left many of our more diverse and culturally diverse, both by language and culturally diverse populations out of the mix, as well as uh, students from lower socioeconomic levels. So why, Paul, do you think having an educational standard that said this is the way it is, like one plus one equals two, left various groups out of the mix? Well, I think colleges and universities have been saying for some time that by and large students aren't graduating high school ready for college level work. Mm -hmm. And the fact is in college you're not doing one plus one equals two. You're doing much more complex thinking and uh, you mentioned creativity, Gloria. You're expected at the college level to think deeply enough mm -hmm. so that you can start to push the boundaries and think innovatively and demonstrate learning in unique ways. So I think that's where the need uh, came from. Um, you know, we, we had a system of pencil and paper tests in place that uh, maybe touched a lot of standards very superficially. And I think the Common Core is really pushing us to create that depth of thinking and that depth of knowledge. Braulio, you, I guess, uh, among the three of us, or mm -hmm. maybe among the four of us, were in, were, you were in school more recently than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> were you alienated in any way by the system that you came out of? I think so, and I think uh, prior to the show, we were having the discussion. Uh, you know, I'm a product of, of East Palo Alto. I went through the Ravenswood School District, graduated from McNair in 2003, and uh, and I was really, you know, I went, I was lucky enough to go to Miller Atherton, really proud to be a bear. However, when, when I first came to, to, to Menlo Atherton, I was placed in, uh, in ESL classes. I grew up in East Palo Alto um, in America, and I've always felt like I've been affluent in, uh, in, in reading and in math. And so that was, you know, I, I think that's the narrative of a lot of the students in East Palo Alto. And I think uh, Common Core will give an opportunity for a couple of things to happen. One is for students to really be challenged and be able to uh, show their potential. And then the other thing is it's, you know, it, it's, it's an opportunity if, um, if implemented correctly to give young people voice, right? One of the things, one of the goals of, of Common Core is to, to develop critical thinkers and problem solvers. And I think being a critical thinker and a problem solver, you have to, you have to start where, with you. Right, your situation economically at home, uh, your community, and be able to think about solutions that way. And that's the story of the, a lot of the young people I have the privilege of working with. Okay, we'll get back to that. Uh, we've talked around it, so let's talk about it. What, what is the Common Core? How would you describe it? Well, I, I think uh, for us, what it has meant is really looking at uh, Knowledge is a basic knowledge, reading and writing, reading comprehension, mathematical skills. Uh, basically, uh, as you say, one and one is two. However, uh, how do you demonstrate that? How do you show that you understand it? You don't have to speak English fluently to be able to demonstrate mathematical concepts. Uh, science, uh, scientific programs, we have, again, um, by the, by integrating the common core, common core knowledge now is reading across and literacy across content areas. So we're looking at literacy, not just in terms of reading stories and narratives, but really integrating science, integrating history, integrating um, problem solving and demonstrating. The, so there, the, the, uh, one of the things that Braulio and um, that we discussed earlier is uh, a concept that uh, through the youth organizing group that he's doing, uh, they brought students in and asked them, what are the problems that, you're that you are experiencing in your community and in, it, in your education? And what are the things that you'd like to see and how can we solve them? That is a perfect example of common core usage, common core knowledge, because they came up with some things that they wanted. They wrote about them, they dialogued about them, they talked about possible solutions, and now they're working on those solutions. That's what Common Core is about. Oh, that's interesting. It, it looks, some would say it's more problem solving, it's perhaps. It's completely, it's critical thinking, uh, problem solving, innovations. Uh, we're doing a lot of work in Ravenswood right now through the with Common Core around um, STEM, science, technology, uh, uh, excuse me, 
engineering and math. math. And, and, and art. And They're now art say STEAM. STEAM. Right. STEAM. Yes. So right. it's mm -hmm. all integrated as part of our um, literacy initiative. So it seems it's making education, you said integrated, more integrated, uh, taking in to consideration, encompassing various aspects right. of everyday life. Mm -hmm. And again, it's very engaging for students because they can find a way. If he, he, uh, Brawley was talking about student voice. Mm -hmm. They're not the empty vessel that's going to be filled by the teacher's knowledge. They are creators of their own knowledge because they can follow interest exactly. that really, um, that they want to pursue to so meet those standards. So it seems they're making interpretations from the information that yes. they're receiving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's something that we worked really hard um, uh, at Overfelt to create. We focused as a staff very specifically on what our vision of mm -hmm. the Common Core would be mm -hmm. for our school and for our community mm -hmm. uh, of students. And uh, we've really hit upon the creative thinking aspect. And so we've pushed uh, to create more student-centered instruction in our classrooms and really develop assignments that uh, don't just uh, give students the opportunity to follow directions, but give them a chance to build upon the teacher's guidance and the material that's delivered in their unique way. It, so it is interpretive. It's it's applying the knowledge in a way that's very relevant to the youth, and we've really pushed instruction that way very consciously. Well, it certainly seems, given the high dropout rates, yeah. that this is a system mm -hmm. that is more engaging to the students mm -hmm. themselves. If, Absolutely. If, if I can, so one of the things that Yuka did was uh, we, we work with a, a, another nonprofit in San Mateo, Youth Leadership Institute, and one of the things that we did is that we, we surveyed 150 students, and what we were, our task was to, to find out what students from Ravenswood, Sequoia Union High School District, and Jefferson High School District, what did they know about Common Core? And one of the problems that we've seen is that 65, 60, about 65 percent of the students that we, that we uh, reached out to didn't know about Common Core. So one of the things as we address Common Core, we also have to think about how we incorporate the voice of the young people. And, and you know, it, it, it highlighted a couple of things, right? It, you know, and, and it's been said, but I want to definitely echo um, because it's needed. I think a lot of times we've had to, you know, as adults, um, we think about young people, students, right, uh, as, uh, you know, as, as um, not being able to form an idea and be able to express it, that, you know, the, 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 uh, presentations and the focus groups that we've done has really contradicted that. You know, the young people are critical now. You know, they, they can think critically. They see what the problem is and they could easily come up with a solution. And we've seen that. Um, what I think is missing and I think needs to be, be incorporated is, is this, this, this thought or this idea that we can, you know, in order for us to not just focus on a common core, but to improve the education system, is to, is to incorporate the young people into the, into the problem solving. Um, as well as the parents and community organizations. Um, and one of the things, you know, one of the things that I, we have to really think about it. At the end of the day, who is affected and who benefits from the teaching or non-teaching is the students. And if we want to create a, you know, a, a young people who are, are ready to go to college, we need to be able to invest in them. And for some, some students, investing them is just opening, you know, the doors to have a conversation and to value their, their opinion. So let's go more deeply into Common Core standards themselves. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned what it meant for Overfelt. Mm -hmm. And you prepared a slide presentation. And so let's take a look at it and maybe go through some of it, talking about each slide and, and getting your reactions. So uh, we're looking at the first one, I hope, up there on um, uh, how, what, what would you say about that? So, so this, um, uh, this is a basic uh, breakdown of, of our school's demographics. We're 90% uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged. Um, vast majority of our students are English learners, most of them long term. Um, uh, a, fair, a, a very uh, solid special needs population and most of our uh, parents are um, high school graduates or uh, did not complete high school. So uh, a lot of first generation uh, uh, seniors okay. uh, in terms of college going. Paul, let me stop you for a moment. Sure. Do those statistics kind of resemble what's in the Ravenswood City School District? Actually, ours are 95% um, free and reduced lunch. 
85% uh, uh, Latino, 11% uh, African American, and, uh, and then the rest is uh, a Pacific Islander. Mm. And we have a um, pretty large number of English learners. It's in about 82%. So your two school districts would fall maybe at the bottom in terms of performing school districts right. in California. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you are um, very enthusiastic that Common Core can turn that some of those statistics around. Yes. Well, and let's be clear that uh, underperforming is under the old regime of paper and pencil test uh, as the way to measure performance. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Common Core, I think, really gives a lot more credence to uh, education that is more student-centered and is much more student-relevant mm -hmm. in terms of how they apply the material. Okay, so let's go on to the second slide. So um, in, in terms of what the Common Core uh, actually consists of, it's new standards in math and in English, and that includes um, reading and writing standards that span all subject areas. So uh, one of the groundbreaking things of Common Core, one of the groundbreaking elements is that now all subject areas in a secondary school, whether it's history, science, or the arts, or electives, they're all charged with explicitly teaching close reading strategies and explicitly teaching writing. Now, let's, let's get this straight. The information in terms of English and history and math, the content remains the same. It's a method, it's the approach to presenting the content. The curriculum, the actual textbooks could remain the same. The difference, uh, many times it doesn't, it doesn't remain the same, but what the big shift is in the instruction, how teachers work with students, how teaching and learning occurs in the classroom, and the performance outcomes for students that, in the way they demonstrate their knowledge. The, so that's, it's those more are the participatory changes. on the yes. part of the students. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the third slide, if we could. So uh, these are slides from uh, presentations that we've actually done to parents um, uh, to explain uh, the basic principles of the Common Core. So we, we started with kind of the old school, uh, pre-Common Core idea about education, which is the teacher holds all the information, the student absorbs the information, and then if you go to the next slide, uh, the student is basically expected to bring that information back on a test. Um, and uh, what we have found, uh, as we mentioned earlier, is that colleges and universities are saying this is not enough. These are not the only skills that students need to have in order to be ready for university level work. And okay. can I interject something? Sure, here? and we can lose that slide just for the moment. But the other thing that happens is not only are our students not college and career ready, but they're not prepared for the workforce either. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't and, prepare. Uh, a middle school student for the workforce, now can you? Actually those skills, uh, we've done backward mapping and those skills that predict success uh, and ha having all of the assets to be a successful young adult actually um, start to be manifested in preschool. Mm -hmm. For example, give well, me an example. Okay, I'll give you an example. We, we talk about um, starting our kindergartners um, kindergarten ready. In Ravenswood, in our district, two-thirds of our students come into our kindergarten classes already two years behind because we don't have enough preschools and preschool space for them. So uh, where in other parts of our community, uh, when children start kindergarten, they've already been in a preschool program for two years a very high functioning preschool that has a lot of enrichment activities, a lot of language rich activities, a lot of engaging activities. And our children come in without that foundation. And you add to that um, the language um, issues where they might speak another language at home so they are acquiring English. So you're talking about basic skills. Basic skills, but they, we talk about, you know, we're, this is all tied to that achievement gap, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which there is a gap that already exists in kindergarten. And each year, 
of it gets school, it wider. gets wider and wider for many of our students. Okay, now, when we looked at that slide, the last one, Paul talked about the testing, that mm -hmm. students are supposed to give back what they learned on mm -hmm. the test. They'll still be tested, won't they? Yes, absolutely. Okay, can we go to the next slide? So under the, the, the common core structure, um, rather than students simply devouring the information, we see, we see our job as uh, building young chefs of information, if you will. So the common core uh, really demands that uh, the instruction changes so that the kind of learning students are able to do changes. We want students who don't just absorb information, exactly. but who know, who know how to find information for the questions they're asking, how to manipulate uh, and address that information so that they can apply it to real situations around them and express their unique points of view. So what that reminds me of is learning by rote where you, you learn the formulas, you learn the rules of grammar, and you give it back to the teacher. That was the old style. Mm -hmm. That's, That's right. Yes, That's right. yes. yes. exactly. Mm -hmm. And so now this is the manipulation, the ability right. to manipulate that. Yes. Uh, can we go to the next slide, if there is a next slide? Well, it's, um, uh, it, it, it looks much less cluttered with the animation, but essentially uh, we talk about the real shift in math. Um, which uh, students and, and teachers are at Overfeld are really in the trenches of. And um, if in the background there you see the multiplication table, and if the old school simply demanded that students memorize the multiplication tables so that they could recite what 11 times 4 was, um, with the common core, it, it's very much conceptual so that you understand that um, okay, when I say 8 times 5, what I'm really doing is taking groups of 8 like eight slices in the pizza there, and multiplying that out by five groups or five pizzas. So Common Core really stresses uh, uh, language usage in math so that students don't just get how the numbers work together, but they understand conceptually what they're doing at, at any time they're, mm -hmm. they're calculating. Uh, Braulio, do you have any comments on well, the slides and what we've seen this Not far? about math specifically. I think one of the other things that, well, I know that one of the other things that uh, Common Core addresses is the English component. And one of the things that we did in our study groups or in, in our presentations is we asked, you know, one of, we asked the question, what engages you, right? If, if a teacher's supposed to engage you and you're supposed to become a critical thinker, what will we'll, we'll engage you? And we found very, you know, we, and students are very critical and very thoughtful. And for the students that we surveyed in Ravenswood School District, uh, we not only did we didn't only just work with schools and going to, to the classrooms, we also work with community organizations um, in East Palo um, that engage young people. And a couple of things came out, right? Specifically about the English class, if you know, and we asked like, what's going to engage you? And young people said, you know, what's more engaging than learning my history, right? Ethnic studies will engage me. We're in class all the time. Right? And sometimes I can't relate to the, to the, to the curriculum. So as, uh, you know, as we talk about Common Core, not only there has to, it, it, it's not just a change in how teaching happens, that, uh, come from teacher, it's what the, you know, the curriculum, what opportunity do we have to implement a new curriculum that's gonna engage students to build their interest. Similarly, one of the things that they said is like, you know, we, East Palo is a really new uh, city with a lot of history. Why not teach that, right? And so it's, it's, it's a couple of things that you know, that, 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 that were highlighted that I think are really worth looking at and researching. Okay, now, if you stress the creativity mm -hmm. and the manipulation of the content, then it almost gets as if it, it becomes very individualized. Yes. But then at the same time, there has to be something common about it that cuts across the individualization so you could really see the mastery that the student mm -hmm. has, and if it's all individualized. But it's, it's the mastery of the concepts is what we're looking at. The mastery of the foundational concept and many different ways of expressing it. And what's the beauty of the Common Core when it's project-based or performance-based is that students can work individually, they can work in groups, but the sharing that comes out, they get to see how other uh, students and other pairs or other groups attacked the same problem and how they solved it. And the concepts are all going to be the same, but the way of showing and demonstrating their knowledge is going to be different based on the group. Okay, now Paul, you said that 
what has been done traditionally has not been good enough for colleges. Mm -hmm. Why? If students, those who do score high on the SATs, mm -hmm. uh, can demonstrate by their high scores that they've mastered the material, is that good enough? Well, the colleges and the universities uh, have said that um, the the high school uh, transcript GPA and some of the state test scores doesn't hasn't indicated uh, college readiness to this point. And I think that goes back to what the standards uh, focused on because the state tests were built on the old set of standards. So I with with Common Core. Um, and again, this shift towards really centering instruction on the student and how the student masters skills. Um, we're, we're getting ready for, we're getting them ready for uh, the college going environment. At, at Oberfeld, we hold a, a voluntary Saturday school uh, twice a month where students can come and meet with teachers and study independently, get help when they need it. And, I'll, and our library, looks like a college library with students uh, using laptops that we provide. Uh, they're sitting in tables and groups collaboratively putting together uh, their projects for a variety of classes. Um, teachers are holding essentially office hours in their classroom and we regularly get uh, 300 students showing up on a Saturday voluntarily to to have that additional engagement. So Braulio, I think you're 100% right. I'm seeing plenty of evidence mm -hmm. that this new shift in instruction actually engages students more. Mm -hmm. um, it's bringing them to our campus on a Saturday in droves. That's amazing. And I think we have, yes. I, I just wanted to add a little bit to this. Sure. The model that we've used in, in schools for a long time was based on the needs of our old economy. Mm. And the economy and um, technology, there have been great advances. So uh, let's talk about the old economy mm -hmm. and how that differs from our global economy now? Right. Well, uh, a lot of it really is, well, here in Silicon Valley, I think we're at the forefront of, of the new economy, our, our boom right here with technology. But all of those technologies and those, the approach that is so necessary with um, the new marketplace and the global economy, it's really not about rote memorization or having the right answer. It's having a, a breadth of knowledge or a foundational knowledge of concepts so that if there's a problem, you can solve it, you can find a new solution for it. So it's, it's innovative thinking. And uh, in a lot of, of what we're looking at, the jobs that, are, that we're hiring right now, they did not exist. 25, 30 years yes, ago. Yes, we're not in or necessarily 15. 15 a, a, a manufacturing economy right. anymore. And so the skills uh, that employers are looking for are for jobs, uh, well, jobs of the future that right now we don't even know what those jobs are. That's true. So it's that adaptability of having, uh, being able to figure things out and adapt to the needs of the workplace and explore and be able to uh, think out of the box. Let's go through the rest of the slides and then we'll go back to thinking out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a summary of what uh, our entire district, the Eastside Union High School District, has uh, focused on in terms of uh, their vision to go along with the Common Core. Uh, students graduating uh, not just knowing information, but empowered mm -hmm. to really transform their lives and to thrive in a global society. Mm -hmm. And uh, the mission connected to that focuses on our learning environments changing so that mm -hmm. they are more dynamic, they are more flexible. As you said uh, earlier, Henrietta, they, they are designed to give each student a chance to access the material in a slightly different way. It is very differentiated and dynamic. Um, because that's what's needed to really inspire students to develop those critical thinking skills, those problem solving skills. I'll give you a quick example. Our, our biology teachers collaborated um, when they were all focusing on uh, various uh, cellular processes in the body and decided that the end product uh, was going to be a public service announcement that the students created uh, independently to show what they uh, were able to get out of those units mm -hmm. and 
So they're presenting the knowledge in unique ways because the PSAs all looked very different, but it's, it's about how they're able to make sense of their own understanding of what happens in the body and what it means to be healthy and express that. And the teachers are working very closely and very collaboratively um, so that they can assess each individual uh, PSA um, to see how the mastery is, is being demonstrated, even as different content is being highlighted in each one. Sure, I think we have maybe one or two more slides left. So uh, at Overfeld High School, um, we've been working very intently uh, for the last year on craft crafting and realizing our own specific vision. So the, if the district vision covered uh, uh, a broad sense of being em empowering students, we honed in specifically on graduating critical and creative thinkers with the resilience to achieve. Um, uh, we realized that uh, as a high school um, working in a, a typically underrepresented community in terms of college going. Uh, mo the vast majority of our seniors who go to college are first generation seniors. So that resilience becomes an important piece that we're not just expecting them to do larger projects, but we're very strategic in terms of teaching them how to be resilient uh, uh, when they encounter difficulty and to push through that adversity so that their learning can really shine through. And we're finding our teachers and our students are both showing tremendous resilience and really doing uh, the great work. Now, I have to say this all sounds very idealistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. There's a lot of hard work that has to go into exactly. it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, on, on and, the part of. And well, um, and we talked, we spoke about how the teaching has to change, has to be very different, a very different style of um, teaching has to happen. And uh, it's very different from what's go been going on um, previous to this time. So there's a lot of professional development and um, dialogues and collaboration mm -hmm. amongst teachers within content areas and grade levels and even across grade levels. So mm -hmm. uh, in our district, we, are in, um, we have a preschool to eighth grade district in Ravenswood. We're doing a lot of collaboration with Menlo Atherton High School and the Sequoia High School District to ensure that we're all uh, aligning and collaborating so that we can guide students in and, and our teaching staff in how we're working together on the Common Core. So that we've just started the real work. <laughs> yes. In, and, but yes. there is a huge amount of work. I think that what this will do it com is really reinvigorate our, uh, I believe, our faith and trust in our public education system which I think has been taking a beating for a, a long time uh, because yes, we been. haven't been able to produce students that, uh, you know, with the outcomes that people expected. But the way we were teaching and the expectations and the way we were assessing mastery really in many, many ways uh, held students from uh, certain communities back. Mm -hmm. It was real, and, and education is a civil rights issue. Yes, it is. So, now, now, given all you've said and how idealistic all of this mm -hmm. sounds, why is it low performing school districts are for it, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the affluent school districts? Braulio, that's what a good, might you that, think? That's a good question. I think, um, I mean, I could speak specifically for East Palo Alto. Um, you know, or what I see happening in East Palo Alto, I think. Uh, you know, East Palo is often forgotten about in this, you know, this tech industry or this, you know, this this region, and I can see how, you know, I can, it's we're really unrepresented as people of color in the tech industry, yeah. and yeah. I see the opportunity for for people of color to really step up and own those positions if they're if our young people are trained now. So when mm -hmm. we're talking about experience and you know what what's engaging, I keep going back to the to the marvelous things and like the you know the really innovative things that I heard when we did these focus groups. Young students really want to know how, how to code. There's there's organizations that are teaching that in East Palo Alto. They're putting coding, you know, one hour coding uh, sessions. And so I think that, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's part it's, of our curriculum. It's part of the <laughs> curriculum. Yeah, it's, it's and it's one of the things that we have to really highlight. Yeah. Common Core and yeah. education, yeah. the 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 change is not just education, or is that is not just the educators. I think it's an opportunity. Right, right now, we're an opportunity to really. Uh, analyze and, and, and identify some of the things that, that, that need to go in to make education work for our students, right? And I think, I, you know, it's, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what, 
what what's happening you know what we what the fix is but i know one of the key things is that we need to really start working collaboratively and not just as educators or, or uh, community organizations but students what what do you think incorporating parents and incorporating community organizations so you have explained what it you how you see it and what you think it will mean for students in east palo alto mm -hmm. those who've been kept behind or have been behind but the question still stands. Mm -hmm. You can talk about the benefits mm -hmm. for low performing districts that you see, yeah. but why is it? That why is it being challenged by? By some affluent school yes. districts. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go to the next question, but mm -hmm. answer that one first. Well, I think, I think um, there's always, um, you know, I, I know Braulio's a, an organizer and I, I was uh, I was c involved in community organizing for an, ten years before I came back into education. So what I can say is that change is very difficult when you're in t on the top. And so uh, it, it has served our educational system has served middle class and upper middle class communities well. Uh, in many, many ways, there has been a lot of research that says um, that our schools were really sorting, uh, a, dy a dynamic for sorting uh, students and, and our future workers into certain categories. And so right now, this is basically a revolution. It's an mm -hmm. educational revolution. And so in a revolution, Tables are turned, power dynamics are shifted, and uh, and that causes uh, unease of, and uncertainty. So, so I think that's can the foundation. everybody? And and the general question is the basic question: Can everybody be accommodated at the table? I believe so. I mean, we can, are importing. Are, we are importing workers mm -hmm. by the thousands for the jobs that Braulio was talking about. H-1B visas in this country, everybody wants to expand the immigration for H-1B visas because they can't find workers, people that with the background and the expertise to fill the jobs here in our area. And what will that mean? Well, Wait, well, well, you no longer have an underclass. I mean, it's <laughs> you know, ideally we, we should not. This is America. <laughs> but I think that, that the whole premise about our educational system is access and equity for all. That universal education, that, that's a promise. And it's been a promise that there had been, a, you know, from uh, Johnson, President Johnson's time, uh, the um, Elementary and Secondary Education Act that was meant to level the playing field. There's, there have been efforts, No Child Left Behind. Uh, there have been efforts through for, for a long time since Brown versus uh, the Board of Education to provide equal access to education. It has been a promise that has not been reached. And you think uh, the Common Core Standards is an opening door yes. to reach that promise. It's an avenue, mm -hmm. but it's it's, yeah. but it, it's it's not the Common Core is is not a panacea. Mm -hmm. um, just because we adopt the Common Core Standards doesn't mean all the doors open. I mean, mm -hmm. at Overfell, we realized very quickly as our staff work to shift instruction and work on the new standards, we realize very quickly that there's a cultural shift that exactly. needs to accompany the classroom mm -hmm. shift. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we've worked to make sure our entire mm -hmm. school lives and breathes uh, a college-going culture. Mm -hmm. um, uh, our summer bridge program for mm -hmm. incoming freshmen, the vast majority of each freshman class come the summer before their freshman year to our summer institute, where they not only have the opportunity to take academic classes that can prepare them for the work, and in some cases get them ahead uh, in math or English, but uh, we also take that as an opportunity to expose them to uh, our college-going culture. So they're sorted into teams. Each team picks a mascot from a university. So we have the University of Nevada Wolfpack and the USC Trojans represented in our 
uh, rising ninth graders um, who who haven't quite started ninth grade yet, but they have. They've just started in June, as opposed to in August when our school year starts. Braulio, Paul just talked about a cultural shift. Mm -hmm. What does that cultural shift mean for you? How would you interpret it? Well, I think uh, one of the things that I can highlight um, that came out of our, our presentations and our focus groups was the culture shift. The culture shift in parents, right? It's you know we ask the young people um, if you can have a wish list, you know what would be what are some of the things that you would like to see that will make your educational experience um, easier, and they you know they asked about support and I, I asked them well what does support really you know what what does it really mean, um, and they they said parent engagement, um, and and I think you know when uh, Dr. Hernandez highlighted a couple of things right when we talk about East Palo Alto, we have 85% Latino and 4% Pacific Islanders, right. Nine, uh, and 11 percent uh, African-American. For, for a lot of the, this population, being engaged and supporting our young, our young student, our, our child, it doesn't, sound, it doesn't sound like it's something that we do. Right? It's, it's, we don't know how. We don't know how to navigate the, you know, the, the, the education system, especially if you come from a country where, or if you receive the sixth grade education, you can you know, pursue education after that. And that's a narrative in the story of a lot of our community and our parents. Well, you put the emphasis on the parents, mm -hmm. and when I think of that, I think of the cult, the interest in academics f mm -hmm. on the part of the students, and making it all right to be engaged mm -hmm. academically. Mm -hmm. So is that part of the cultural shift where you're not just acting like somebody else to be interested in, in achieving? Mm -hmm. So what does that cultural shift mean for you? I think it's, it's a cultural shift on all fronts mm -hmm. uh, because yeah. it's, uh, it, in order for parents to feel uh, welcome and that, they, that what their opinion and their knowledge is important and valid at the school, they have to feel welcome at the school. They have to be able to communicate with the school. They have to feel that, um, they have value and that their time is is important whether it's a, being able to come to a meeting or being able to follow up or return a call from a teacher so the the language access i think is is a, um, something that needs to be addressed at all of our schools and and we have at our front offices um, but i think um, along with that is before parents can feel welcome the staff at the school including the teachers need to also shift their sense of uh, the community. So it's really not a, a, they have to, the parents need to feel that, that they're partners with the teachers and with the principal and with the, the, the people that work at the district and together. And, and that is something that sometimes is difficult when you have a commuter staff. Ah. And so what we have in, um, in our district, we have very caring teachers uh, and, and principals. Uh, the people that live in the community are basically our classified staff, our support staff. Um, most, and, and not everybody, because the cost of living is so high on this side of the bay. Many of our people and our teachers live across the bay where housing is more affordable because they have families. So uh, there, there's a lot of, no matter how involved you are in your community and as a teacher, uh, if you have a family and you need to get home and, and you know, do some more preparation for the next day, it, it limits somewhat that time. But it, it all, all, what you're saying brings up another issue mm -hmm. and that's the expectations that the teachers might have of, of the students. Of the students and, and the And if parents. you have a commuter, mm -hmm. perhaps, uh, core of teachers who are coming into the mm -hmm. community, they may not have the same uh, perceptions about those communities, right. especially if they're considered low performing. Right. So, Paul, mm -hmm. you kind of <laughs> I, well, you look a little quizzical. Well, I, I would say I would say that uh, at Overfelt, um, we've worked very hard to uh, connect to the larger community. Um, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, nearly a quarter of our staff uh, be Overfelt alumni. Um, what we what we see is that students who graduate from Overfelt they come back because they want to serve the community that served them well. 
I would say a key component is um, when when you live in a community like Eastside San Jose, um, where the neighborhoods can be pretty rough a lot of the time, uh, it's important for the school to become an oasis from that. And our safety team has worked very hard to make sure that uh, the learning environment is absolutely safe so that it can focus on academics. Um, we went we went to from dozens of fights uh, five, six years ago to uh, less than 10 last year. Um, so our safety team's done a tremendous job of making that environment safe enough so that students can zero in on the academic push. And then the other thing is that we're very conscientious of the fact that our senior students are going to be first generation mm -hmm. college students, which means they're not coming from families where the parents have gone through the college application process. They haven't filled out financial aid applications before. So the school needs to be very proactive uh, in terms of making sure the, the students and the parents are aware of the process. Uh, we invite uh, parents to campus several times a year. Um, we held a large college day on October 10th when many schools in the Valley celebrated College Day. And we made sure that not only did the students meet with uh, college representatives and our alumni who are going to college, but we brought in parents for a special forum where they talked to parents of recent graduates that are now in college. So we made sure the parents and the students were equally informed of what the college going experience is really like, what is expected of parents, not just now when their students are seniors, but in the years to come when their student is now in college. Um, we've worked very hard to make sure that everyone in the community is connected to that task, but because we understand that there's a knowledge gap when we have these first generation households, uh, most of our students can't come to their parents for help, so it's up to the schools to provide that help. Sure, now getting back to that cultural uh, reconditioning, so to speak. Braulio, did any of the students in the youth forum that was held on the Common Core mm -hmm. talk about the attitude of the teachers? They did, I think, you know, so I wanna highlight a couple of things, right, because we, so we asked the young people you know, we, we asked them several questions and we were able to analyze, you know, the young people at Yucca were able to analyze some of the information and they highlighted seven things that they would like or they would make for edu a good educational experience. One is student engagement. And it's not, it's, you know, it's a student engagement in curriculum, but also a, a forum or a space in each school where they feel that their voice is heard and accepted and their opinion is valued. The second thing that we already talked about is parent engagement. Right, and, and there's, uh, we highlighted a bunch of voids or things that we need to work with parents in order for that to have, uh, to have that support and engagement. Safe school environment. Um, and that, like I, Paul I, just talked Yeah, and, about. and so we already, you know, that uh, speaks for itself. Uh, engaging in interesting curriculum, right? I think Common Core begins to address that, but we can go further. Um, quality teachers and administrators. And so a couple of things came out of this one, and we kind of started talking about this as well. A big part of, um, you know, when, when we talk about teachers, they're investing something in the, you know, into, into our students. Mm -hmm. But what if we switch it away, right? What if, we, what if we started thinking about, and this is an analysis that somebody came up with at Yucca, and the young person said, what if we started thinking about uh, a teacher as a business, where I go to school, you know, I go to, the, to, to this business to, to buy a service, right? And, and a lot of young people feel like there's a need, right? There's, a, there's, a, and it's, there's that interaction or transaction happening, and there's some, sometimes it feels like the, the teacher's not doing enough. So we need to figure out how, you know, how do we involve the teachers um, into the daily lives of the students, into the community, and to be, become some, some sort of a mentor. Um, the other things that we highlighted is college and career preparedness. Students from East Palo not only want to go to college, they also want to explore different careers. And we're talking about barbers, nurses, you know, auto, uh, automobile technicians, and, and it just is very diverse. And the other thing that was very interesting is that we want to be able to have accurate, uh, individualized educational program, um, evaluation and support. So a lot of our young people from East Palo Alto are placed in IEPs or, in, or this and individual. And what is IEPs? Individual pro, uh, educational program, and I might need a little help, but it, you know, the, the way that I understand it is if a student has a certain uh, circumstance um, where they need uh, support, uh, schools will develop an IEP. And the, you know, the support ranges any, anywhere from a, you know, from a learning disability to health, you know, to um, a health, um, um, a, a health disability, 
Um, a lot of times young people have, you know, they, their de um, schools develop IEP. But we feel sometimes, and we've talked to students where, where they feel like they don't need an IEP. All they need is, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's attention because they don't get it at home. Right? And so if a young person is not getting attention at home or is ha has a, a rough home life, um, then when they're, they'll act up at school. And sometimes that, that calls for IEP to be placed. And so we wanted that something so that we want to So an IEP is explore. not necessarily looked at as a good thing. Sometimes it's not. Because uh, you would think that it's something, the way it was first described, is additional assistance for that student. There are, there are some processes in mm -hmm. place uh, before a student has an IEP, um, a student um, success team uh, or student study team process where uh, there's a meeting with teachers, with um, uh, speech and language folks, uh, the parents and uh, the principal academic support, uh, discuss the students' needs, and then interventions are in place for a certain length of time. Um, and this goes on for a bit. It actually, I think students need to have um, either, if it's a medical issue or a challenge, it's automatic because that's, it's, uh, it's the federal law. But the academic supports, um, it's usually a delay or some kind of a learning, identified learning disability after a battery of tests. I see. So it's, it's actually a, a long-term process before a student gets an IEP, mm -hmm. but they, there's an, you can exit an IEP. The, again, there has to be a lot of support in monitoring of student progress, and if they're doing well, they should be, if it's an academic or behavioral, IEP, they should be able to exit the plan. So on is that something goals. that's held against them? No, I don't no. think it needs to be. No. Oh. I don't think it needs no. to be. But it, but this speaks to the cultural shift that we're yeah. talking about with Common Core because you're talking about students receiving services through special education, and as as soon as that term special ed is thrown out, yeah. it calls yeah. up a perception of students who aren't going to go to college because of their challenges, and we certainly don't. We certainly don't view it that way uh, 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 in our schools. Mm -mm. Um, it's, it's a student who needs a little extra support, but the goal is still the same. We, we still want them to access that rich curriculum, uh, to have that opportunity to think deeply and think creatively. Uh, at Overfelt this year, we're experimenting with uh, team teaching where a general ed teacher and a special ed teacher teach a gen ed course together uh, so uh, it can be Common Core Integrated Math 1, we have an English 1 class that's paired, and so the, the students who have disabilities and IEPs in those classes get the best of both worlds, the rich, uh, uh, the rich uh, education, the rich college-going curriculum paired with the support uh, that meets the needs mm -hmm. of their IEP. Sure. Now, your mention of the IEP started mm -hmm. us on this, mm -hmm. this Trap. <laughs> Did you finish the seven things that came out of the forum? The seven ideas that the students came up with. Yeah, we we did. You, we covered you finished them. that. <laughs> now we talked about getting students college ready. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it a practical idea? To I think believe that it's all important. children can be college ready. Yes, and uh, I I firmly believe that our job is in K or preschool to twelfth grade education, our job is to prepare students for possibilities mm -hmm. and then they make choices in life. But a child shouldn't leave our schools if they have the desire to go to college that they are not able to go because of the of lack of preparation. So and they might very well have the preparation but not have the money. <laughs> uh. They might not have the money but they might want, they might have other interest. Mm -hmm. Uh, but again, the, I think our job is to prepare them for, I, I like to think of endless options and possibilities for themselves. And, and then if they don't have money, exactly what you're talking about, that there are ways of going to college and, and um, on loans and grants and work study. And, what, and we're a K-8 system, but we have uh, we, they call them FAFSA sessions mm -hmm. for the parents. We have them at our schools and we invite parents so, over so that they can apply for their older children. Mm -hmm. When did the Common Core standards start? 
as a part of the curriculum in Ravenswood? Uh, well, it's, I, it's my second year there. I think it's three years. Three mm -hmm. years the, ago? Three years, yes. And for Oberfeld? That they've been kind of yeah, progressively it, moving in. Yeah, and, and about, about the same uh, at Overfelt. Um, and, and as I said earlier, the standards were accompanied by a shift in instruction, a real look at centering mm -hmm. instruction around the students, centering of the learning around mm -hmm. the students as well. So it's been three years now. Yes, it's, it started as, um, with English and the literacy, and uh, that was the first foray, that, that, that was our first Any entree in the announced math. Any difference yet in the performance of the students? Well, you know, we had the trial run for the, the assessments, the field test last, uh, last spring, and then we, all, all of our students participated. We did it across the board for all of our students in, in Ravenswood. And then we found out that we won't get results. Um, so it's hard to tell because it was you a field test. You won't get results at all? Well, we haven't received any. I think they're, they're not gonna count them. And, and because right. the test, it was a field test, they're going to redo the real test is the one that's coming up this spring. But you would think even with the field test, you, it would give you some, some idea. idea. Yeah. And they may of what's release it. And what's they may not release working. it at some point, but we haven't received. And any you can't. Results. You just can't ask. Can we see it? I think they the way they run their data system. I think they were setting up. The state was setting up their data system, and and this was like a bank of questions, and they they tried to put some together thoughtfully, but it was the first run. At the high school level, uh, we have uh, a little more uh, uh, different kinds of data to work work yeah. with and I would say we're seeing uh, quite a bit of success. Uh, when you look at the percentage of students that graduate high school with yeah. the A through G requirements intact, yeah. meaning they've met the coursework that University of California expects to be college ready. Uh, statewide, uh, Latino students are completing those A through G classes at about 20%. Last May's graduating class at Overfeld, a predominantly Latino class, uh, over a third of the students and graduated what was it A before? through G complete. What was it before? It was actually a, a, about a 15% jump for us. So we went from well, one year where we were in line with the state Latino eligibility rate to this past May, our seniors uh, improved upon that by well over 10 percentage points. What would you like to see, Braulio? You know what I found interesting and, and, and um, when we talk about college and career preparedness, what I found really interesting is that uh, Sequoia Union High School District, as I understood it, and I may be wrong, but the way I understood it is that our high school our high school graduation requirements do not meet the A through G requirement, which means that if a student from Sequoia Union High School District graduates high school, they're not eligible to, to go to uh, for or they don't they don't meet the requirements. Oh really? In order for them to go to um, I, well, actually, the, I think. Uh, not what happens, and this this is uh, what happens when when students are placed in. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we would love to talk about different. what happens, but <laughs> we've run out of yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> but we have talked about a lot, at least in terms of what the Common Core standards are, and we'll be saying a lot more about them in the future. So I'd really like mm -hmm. to thank the three of you for thank joining you. me, at least to lay the groundwork. And I'd like to thank our viewers for watching. Until next time.